So we, we're doing, um, <coughs> we're starting a new series today um, on the character of, of Elijah. Everyone say Elijah. 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 Yeah, Elijah. Um, lo- found this lovely verse in the New Testament, James 5.17. When we talk about Elijah over the next couple of weeks, some of the stuff that he does is pretty radical. Like next week we're going to hear about him calling fire down from heaven. All right. Anyone ever called fire down from heaven before here this morning? No. Right. He did that. He did that. Today we're going to hear about Elijah, how he he stood up to a king and told him what's for. We're going to hear about Elijah today, about how God miraculously provided for him. We're going to hear about today how ravens came and fed him. I mean, how weird is that? Like birds coming to give you your dinner. Normally it's the other way around, isn't it? But all these things happen to Elijah. And the amazing thing that the Bible says about Elijah is this, okay? Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah, or another version, just so that we all feel included in this this morning, another version says this, Elijah was a human being just like us. And I think sometimes we have to be careful when we look at these Old Testament characters particularly, because like amazing things happen through them, and the miraculous was really displayed in, a, in an amazing way. But James, in the New Testament, he talks about the prayer of a righteous man or a righteous person being effective and powerful. And he goes on to use Elijah as an example But he reminds us, and I remind you this morning, Elijah was a man just like you, okay? Just like you. He was just like you. He had the same human um, frailties. Um, Anyone ever been depressed in the room before? Yeah, I've been depressed. You know what the great thing is? That Elijah was really depressed once. And anyone ever felt fear before? Good. Well, Elijah felt fear as well. Elijah knew what it was to leg it and to run because he was afraid. So this morning, as we read about the miraculous in Elijah's life, the thing to remind ourselves is this, that Elijah was a man just like you. He was a human being just like you. He didn't always get it right, but when we look at the life of Elijah together this morning, we see that he was a man who had a heart to serve God. In the face of the enemy, he was fearless because he understood that one with God is a majority. And so we'll read this morning some passages from 1 Kings chapter 17. We'll see that Elijah walks through some different experiences. Elijah was a prophet. He was someone who spoke the word of the Lord. Elijah was incredibly bold. Um, Elijah was someone who God used to point the people back to him. They had kind of wandered away from God's agenda because of the king that was ruling. But Elijah was a mouthpiece for God. And who knows this morning that God wants us to be mouthpieces for him. And we can be, because if we look at the the life of Elijah, we look at a man who was just like us. He was just like us in so many different ways. If you want to see how Elijah fits into Old Testament history, we can look at this diagram. Now, you're all looking, some of you won't be able to see that because you're like, a little bit um, frail, maybe. Can't quite see clearly. Okay? Well, this is a PowerPoint, this is a PowerPoint presentation, okay? It comes from the computer over there. But um, David and Solomon, see King, you see those words, David and Solomon? King David and King Solomon were there. And then the kingdom splits. There are ten tribes in Israel, two tribes in Judah. And as we move along... You see that strip from the top to the bottom, that different coloured strip. We see there the prophet Elijah, and he's speaking to King Ahab at the time of Jehoshaphat, okay? So that's where it fits in in history. If you want to know how that fits into our history, it's 2,800 years ago, all right? It's a long time ago. About 100 years after King David, about 2,800 years ago. But it's amazing... As we look at this, we can sometimes feel like, what on earth does a prophet who lived 2,800 years ago have to do with me? Well, we'll read the Bible together now. 
and we'll understand that um, Elijah faced some challenges that we face in our world today. You know what? The Bible is true where it says there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? And as we look at some of the challenges that Elijah had, there are some of the similar challenges that we face today as we seek to be the prophets, um, to speak the word of the God, to point people back to God. And as we read about Elijah, we're encouraged this morning because Elijah was a human being just like us. And if God can use Elijah, then he can use me and you also. So 1 Kings 16, if you've got a Bible, good to read it. We're going to read a bit of the passage together. 1 Kings 16, and uh, we'll use a few verses there, and then we'll read a little bit more of the narrative. Okay, so 1 Kings 16, verse 29, we read about a king called Ahab. Okay, just humor me this morning. Everyone say Ahab. Ahab. All right, I just need to engage you in this, because I understand sometimes when you're going through stuff, you're like, oh, what's he going on about? King Ahab, he was a bad king. Like, he was really bad. When the Bible talks about him in a moment, you'll see that Ahab is compared to previous kings, but the Bible says that he was was even worse than those kings. Like, he was a bad king. He did things that offended God in a great way. He led the nation of Israel away from God. And we read about him in 1 Kings 16, verse 29, and this is what the Bible says. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. He reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, listen to this, this is the king Ahab we're talking about here. The Bible says he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So imagine being compared as a king to being so bad that you were worse than anyone that had ever come before you. That's what the Bible says about Ahab. It says in verse 31, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, which was idolatry, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. So you get the picture, yeah? King Ahab is a bad king. And it's into this backdrop that um, Ezekiel begins to bring the word of the Lord to the nation at that time. And, you know, as in terms of our, our world in many ways is the same as 2,800 years ago. Okay, when people worshipped Baal, when they did idol worship, there was a high level of sexual immorality that happened. Okay, people worshipped material items, wood, gold, instead of worshipping the living God. And if there was a time in history when we lived at a time where people ignore God and they pursue material things, it is the generation that we live in now. Never in the world have people, particularly in our Western European culture, had as much stuff as we do now. Like, they think they had stuff. Well, let me tell you, we have got more stuff than King Ahab And the nation of Israel had 2,800 years ago. As they turned to idolatry and ignored God, so in our culture today, what do we see? We see people doing everything they can to to replace God around them by stuff and things. And in terms of their worship of Baal, you know, temple prostitution, um, fornication, sexual immorality... That was part of what they did in worshipping items and materialism. And we live in a world today that is sexually immoral. We've moved away from what the Bible teaches, that um, sex is to be enjoyed between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. That's what the Bible teaches us. So we see in our culture that people have gone away from that. And 2,800 years ago, it it was the same thing. And so... Elijah stands as a voice to the nation and begins to declare the word of the Lord. What he begins to do is he begins to lift God up and his name to King Ahab. And in verse 17, we see him address the king. Verse, um, 1 King 17, verse 1, it says, Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, so this is him addressing this evil king He says to him, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. 
That was a big thing to tell the king that it would not rain on the land for the next three, or, well, it didn't rain for the next three and a half years, but to say that to him. Why was that? Because that would bring famine on the land, which would cause um, his kingdom to be weakened and for, for opposing enemies to be able to come in. Okay? So that was not a word that would have been accepted well. But, a, but Ezekiel wanted to proclaim that his God was bigger than any of the gods that um, Ahab had brought in to replace the living God. And so then the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Did I say Ezekiel earlier? Sorry, it's, it is Elijah, it's not Ezekiel. All right. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kirith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook I have ordered and the ravens will feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kirith ravine east of the Jordan and he stayed there. The Bible says the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Okay, so here he is. He's gone off into hiding and the Lord's feeding him day by day, supernaturally feeding him. Okay, and then there's just one more little bit that we need to read together. Verse 7. The Bible says, Some time later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. There had been no rain in the land because God had said there would be no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath, son of Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Listen to this story. This is a great story. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and we may die. How sad, what a, what a sad picture that is, that famine had come so much to her life that she was simply going home to make a meal so that her son could eat it and then they could die. But you see, the word of the Lord comes to the situation. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. And the Holy Spirit says that to us this morning. Whatever our circumstances, how little, however little we feel we may have this morning, he says to us, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me and what you have, and what you have left and bring it to me and then make something for, your, for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord says, <laughs> the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Wow, what a great promise to receive when you haven't got much at all. So she went away and she did as Elijah had told her. And there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Wow, that's what God can do. So, we, so, uh, so as, as, as Elijah faces down this king, <clears throat> we remember Elijah was a man just like us. As he faced him down, we see a few things from Elijah's story that we can apply to our story this morning. So Elijah, as we've read this morning, he was on a journey. He went on a journey to a few places. But first of all, we see the message of his journey. The message of his journey. The message of his journey was to declare that the living God lives, that he is alive. Whereas culture all around him was saying that there was no place for God, Elijah makes a declaration of truth. He says these words, As the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. What Elijah was saying, it doesn't matter, King Ahab, what your agenda is. It doesn't matter the fact that you're promoting immorality. It doesn't matter that you're choosing to worship idols of wood and stone. It doesn't matter that you're choosing materialism over the living God. What, what Elijah was stating as he made that declaration, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, he was de declaring that God was far bigger than King Ahab was. And King Ahab might have his agenda, 
But in bringing this word of the Lord about there being no rain on the land for three years, Elijah was really trumping Ahab and saying, my God is bigger than your God. And, you know, sometimes as we look around our lives, we can become quite discouraged. It seems that people are disinterested. It seems that even in our own lives this morning, church, we have to be careful that we don't allow materialism stuff to become our God because our message isn't one of materialism. Our message this morning is one of what Christ has done for us. This morning, as as, as Elijah had a message to bring to his generation that God was bigger than the circumstances that surrounded them and the gods that they were seeking to replace him with, God gives us a similar message to bring. Our message is one of Jesus. As Elijah says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, whom I serve, our message is the same. As the Lord God of Israel lives, who I serve, who you serve. Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The message, our message, the message of the early church was that that people should repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Paul, writing writing to Timothy, he reminds him that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. The message that we bring is the same as Elijah that there is a God who is alive, who is interested in you and is interested in me. And you know, the world will do all that it can to bring its own agenda. There is an anti-God agenda in the spirit of this world today. You know, the world, if, if the world can ignore the fact that there is a God, then there is no, they don't have to take any responsibility for the sin in their lives. They can do as they please because there's no repercussions, there's no comeback, there's no judgment. And as we watch the news and we see people peddling their agendas, when God isn't involved and God isn't interested, uh, or, or they're not interested in God, we have to understand that the spirit behind it is one of not wanting to believe in any existence of God, because man can do his own thing. And it was no different with Ahab. The reason why Ahab enjoyed idols and materialism and sexual immorality, the reason why he enjoyed those things, because if there was no God, he can do as he pleases. But today we bring a message, we bring a message of hope, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that God is alive, that God is interested, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That is what we believe, that's the message we bring. And as Elijah had a message, as the Lord, the God of... as. <laughs> As, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. That's our message. We have to remember this morning, church, that we serve a living God. We don't follow a good idea. We don't follow a theory. We believe that um, Jesus Christ came, that he died upon a cross, that three days later he rose from the dead, and he lives today, and he's coming back for his church. That's what we believe. That's the message that we have. And as Elijah was challenged to take that message... So we, this morning, we remind ourselves that we too are challenged to take that message. The second thing that we see as we look at the life of Elijah this morning is that he was someone who knew what it was to be guided by the voice of God. Remember what we said at the start, James 5, 17. Elijah was a man just like us. You know what, this morning, church, if Elijah can be guided by the voice of God to go to this place and that place, to speak to that person, to speak to this person, I believe that we, this morning, as followers of Jesus, we can know what it is to hear the voice of God guiding us, showing us, prompting us. When the Bible says what it is, it says, keep in step with the Spirit. I believe that we can know in our everyday lives what it is to be in step with the Spirit, to know exactly what he wants us to do at any particular time. And uh, Elijah knew what it was to be guided by God because he knew what it was to hear the voice of God. And there are two times in these verses that we've read together this morning 
where this same phrase comes, the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The word, and that should challenge us this morning, because if James 5 says that Elijah was a man just like us, or he was a human being just like us, then as the word of the Lord came to Elijah, we have to remember, church, this morning, that the word of the Lord can come to us also. Okay, we don't live in a different era. God hasn't changed. God can still speak today as he spoke to Elijah, as he spoke to the early church. He can still speak to us today. And the Bible says in, um, in verses 2 and 3, it says, The word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the ravine east of the Jordan. So his first movements were these. Okay, so he's in Samaria. Samaria was where he gave the word of the Lord to Ahab. And then the Lord spoke to him, and the Lord said to him, leave that place and go to the brook Kirith. And so Elijah left Samaria and he went to the brook. We believe today that God speaks to us through the Bible. He can speak to us as we pray. He can speak to us through one another. But Elijah took his direction from God. I believe that one of the reasons why God moved Elijah from being in the, in the court of the king and speaking to Ahab and moved into a different place is because on this journey of life that we're on in following Jesus, there are times, you know, when God wants us to leave the stage. He wants us to go to the quiet place. Because, you know, very often in our lives, it's in the secret place that God performs his mightiest works. If we don't know what it is in our lives to sometimes to step away into a quiet place with the Lord, then we don't become the people that God has designed us to be. I believe that all eyes were on him initially, but as he stepped off the stage and he went to the quiet place and found solitude and quietness, we see he was fed by ravens. And we see that God began to, uh, well, God would have ministered to him, God would have spoken to him, and he was there a long while in that place. But you know what? He was, in, he was in that place for a certain amount of time. In our lives also, there are times when we're in a place, but then God moves us on to another place. That can be another church, that can be another job, um, it can be another situation. You know, God moves us from place to place. And, you know, Elijah comes to a point in his life and he's, and he's waiting at the brook where what was right for a season ceased and it was time to do something else. And the Bible says that after a while the brook dried up for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. And then the word of the Lord comes to him again. And the word of the Lord comes to him and it says to him, arrive and go to Zarephath. Okay, so move two. He's at the brook down there on the left, and he leaves that place, and he goes to Zarephath. Why does God allow the brook to dry up? I believe sometimes in our lives, the Lord allows the brook, not literally the brook, but the situation to dry up, because he wants to teach us to trust him, in him trust him in himself and not in his gifts. How often we think we're trusting the Lord when really we're resting on comfortable circumstances. I'll say that again. How often do we think we're trusting the Lord but really we're trusting or resting in comfortable circumstances? When they become uncomfortable, how much faith do we have? Otherwise, what happens, church, is in our lives we rely on the brook rather than him. We rely on what has been provided rather than the provider. And this is the story of my life, okay? A bit of confession for you now, okay? This is the story of my life that, just move that aside. So often in my life, like, I'm, I'm, um, I'm walking close to God and um, things are going well. The brook is flowing. It's flowing with milk and honey, the bank account's full. The church is going well. No one's rang me up to say they don't like me today. I've not received any abusive emails. You, I've, never, I've never received an abusive email from anyone. No, in here, so that's fine. But, but um, from this church, just in case you're looking around to see who's not here this morning, yeah. 
But things are great. And you know what I do in those times when things are great? What I do is the voice of God goes quiet in my life. Because what's happening is I begin to rely on the brook rather than rely on the person that provided the brook in the first place. And so in my heart and my spirit, I kind of, you know, Jesus is alive, everything's great, but I just begin to rely on myself because I think this is going well, life is good. My wife loves me, my kids are behaving themselves, there's money in the bank, things are, you know, things are going good. And you know what, God is very kind to me, very kind to me, because what I believe what he does sometimes is he allows things to not be so rosy, just so that Lucas will wake up, smell the coffee, and understand that actually, Lucas, you don't need to be looking at all the good stuff that God has done in your life. You don't need to rely on those things. You need to rely on the person that gave you in the first place. But unless sometimes I, I just feel those things slipping away a little, I just ignore him and I carry on down this road. So the day I long for is this, that I know what it is for the brook to flow, for life to be great, to live in victory, to follow Jesus with all of my heart, but at the same time to be rejoicing in the fact that it's all because of what my Heavenly Father has given me. And whether this goes well or this doesn't go well, it doesn't matter. Because God is good and he is faithful and I will trust him. And so I don't know why the word of the Lord particularly came to Elijah at that moment, but I kind of got a feeling that Elijah heard the word of the Lord again because the brook went dry, because things... He was maybe getting a bit thirsty and a bit hungry, and he was like, come on, Lord, you know, what's next? There's not a lot going on here. And God is always so kind. He's always willing to come and speak to our situation again. And he does that. And he, and he tells him, and he reminds him. He says to him, get up and go to this next place, because in this place, I want to provide for you again. And the question is this. This is a question. Okay, the question we ask ourselves now is, where is the Lord leading us? You know, what is the Lord wanting to say to us today? But are we ignoring his voice, or does he want to prompt us about something particular in our lives? On a micro level, in our lives, in our workplace, is there someone that the Lord wants to lead us to, to talk to, to encourage, to share Jesus with? In our friendships, there's some people around my life at the moment I need, really need to press in for, on their behalf. I need them to come to know the Lord. I don't, I don't have any non-Christians in my workplace, because you are my workplace. But there are people that surround my life that I know they need to come to know Jesus. And then on a macro level, what's God, what, what's God leading us to do as a church community? You know, what's the word of the Lord to us? Are we just being comfortable in what we have? Or, or do we need to understand that God wants to speak to us again because he has, some, he has somewhere else for us to go? Just as the word of the Lord came to Elijah by the brook, so the word of the Lord can come to us together as a church community, say, actually, I want you to go and meet this need now. Thinking back over the last couple of years, one of the most fruitful things that was, a couple of really fruitful things in our church, our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our life groups, all of those things are great. There's other things being birthed as well, but one of those things is the community meal. The community meal came from just an impression two and a half years ago in a room in Sheffield. And this bloke said, oh, we did this community meal just to reach people and speak to people and just to eat food with them. And I just thought, oh, that's a good idea. And so we went on a path then with that. And as the Lord led us to do that, God's done, you know, God's done lots of good things through that. My point is this, you know, just have ears to hear what the Lord would want to lead you to next. Okay, don't assume that what you're doing now is the, is, the, is the right thing forever and ever. Sometimes the Lord wants to move us on and do something new for us. Maybe you don't feel you're doing much at the moment at all. Well, speak to the Lord and say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? You know, what do you want me to do with my life, my time, my resources? What is it that you're saying to me? Okay, and then the final thing we see is we see provision. We see God's provision for Elijah's journey in these verses that we've read together this morning. We see provision. We see that ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook for many months. 
And over many miles we see God provides and God, God looks after Elijah. We see at the quiet brook God provides bread and meat every day. And then secondly, there's this amazing story in Zarephath where, where the, the word of the Lord comes to Eli, um, Elijah, tells him to go to Zarephath. This is what the Lord says. He says, I've commanded a widow to supply you with food. And so the story is, on this journey that Elijah's having, yeah, the word of the Lord is, go to this place because a widow's going to provide you with food. So he goes to this city and there's a town. As he approaches the town, there's this poor woman. She's collecting some sticks together so that she can make her last meal with her son and then she can die. You know, what a picture of tragedy that is. You know, as we look around our town and our communities, we can see many pictures of tragedy, different, difficult circumstances, um, people being dealt some tough things in life, okay? But what, what the Lord enables Elijah to do, he, he enables him to bring life to that situation through providing food for that family. And it's amazing the, the story that unfolds because you can, look at the, you can look at the story and you just think, God, that's such a harsh thing to do. Because this woman says, I have, a, I have a handful of flour and a little oil. And Elijah says to her, he says, that's okay then. He said, take that oil and that flour and make me a piece of bread first. Make me a piece of bread first. And I read that, I was like, no way, Lord. I can't believe that you said to that widow, make me a piece of bread first. Because imagine being that widow. You've got a handful of flour and a little oil and this prophet's telling you, the word of the Lord to you is that... Um, Make me some first, and then you'll have enough to look after yourself. You know, it's like when you divvy something up at home. You know, you cut it all up, and the kid's like, you know, they take what they have first, and there's nothing left afterwards. That's funny, that. And I bet you felt a little bit like that. Like, is this guy for real? Is he ripping me off? You know, once I've made this bit of bread for him, well, it's all right for Elijah the prophet, because the word of the Lord says this, but what's the reality of that situation going to be? But this morning, I want to commend this woman... Because from the very little that she had, she honoured the word of the Lord first. There's a, that's a great principle for us as followers of Jesus this morning, in terms of the resources that we have in our hands. You know, it can be so easy to say, well, God, you know, th this is mine, and, uh, you know, I'll do with it what I feel I need to do with it. Where, you know, God says, well, actually, you know, what about my kingdom? What about the poor? What about the church? What about that need that you know? You know, what about that first? And reminded this, this morning of the words of Jesus where he says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you also. And the story is that as, as Elijah says to her, he says these words to her, and this is the word of the Lord to us this morning, he says to her, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know what sometimes is the thing that stops us resourcing others, the poor the church, the kingdom of God, you know what it is that holds us back from doing it? It's fear. It's fear that we won't have enough for ourselves. I understand. I've been there myself. Sometimes there's fear. You're like, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? What's all that rooted in? It's rooted in fear. Okay? But the, what the word of the Lord is, is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. But first... And the Bible says that she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. But listen to this. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. You see, when God calls us, provision always comes. Provision came for Elijah because he was where God wanted him to be. Some scriptures to finish off with this morning. I'll be finished in two minutes. This is the first scripture. These are some scriptures for spiritual provision, okay? God wants to provide for you spiritually, your spiritual man. Listen to these verses. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him. Ephesians says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You see, God has provided for you spiritually this morning. 
Next thing that God has provided for you, he has provided for you materially. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, And this same God who took care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches which have been given us in Christ Jesus. Finally, he provides for us physically. He is our provider physically. Psalm 103 verse 3 says, He forgives all my sins and he heals all my diseases. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Lord, I pray this morning for us as a community. Lord, I pray that over these next few weeks as we continue to look at Elijah, I pray the reality of that scripture, Elijah was a man just like us. Father, I pray that you will just awaken something of that spirit of Elijah in us. Lord, we, as, we, as we have read the scriptures this morning, we have seen that Elijah was a man who knew his message. Father, may we be a people that know our message. May we know our purpose. May we not be shy in proclaiming the message that you have given us to share with others. Lord, Elijah was someone who knew what it was to be led by the Spirit day by day. Lord, may we be marked out as a people that know what it is to be led by your Spirit. Lord, from place to place. Elijah might have gone from Samaria to a brook to Zarephath, Lord, may we know what it is to walk from the vending machine to a desk or cross the street to talk to someone because, Father, we have been led and quickened by your Spirit. And, Lord, Elijah experienced your miraculous provision. Lord, if Elijah was a man just like us, then, Father, this morning I pray that we too in our lives, as we proclaim your message, Lord, as we go where you call us to go, Lord, I pray that we will be those that know what it is to receive all that we need from your good hand. Yeah, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Next week we're looking at um, Elijah, um, Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18.